Do you want to know how to take your business idea and actually get started in a business of your own? To be able to attract the right customers, the right clients to your business, people who will value what you do and be happy to pay you for what you do. To be able to get that pricing strategy just right. How do you plan to fund the startup? I know you have a ton of questions. Listen in because the So You Want to Start a Business podcast has been made just for you. In this podcast, we are here to tell terrific business stories to help answer all your questions. I am your host, Ingrid Thompson, and I have been running my own business, Healthy Numbers, for almost 20 years. And over that time, I have worked with literally hundreds of people to help them create, start, and grow their own business, successful and thriving businesses. In this podcast, I speak with inspiring entrepreneurs and business owners about what it takes to get a business off the ground, to get started in business and to continue to be successful. Welcome back to episode number 119 with Emily Sahorsi and Justin Foster from Root and River. I truly struggled to find the one best snippet from this interview and I nearly gave up on the idea altogether and then I thought no I like to have my snippet and here is what Emily and Justin have to say to everyone thinking about getting started in your own business. I would say um, I would say foster that little flame that little spark leave space for it leave time for it put it out there a little bit you know Mm. do what you can to foster it and I think the other thing I would say is look for signs um, that sounds a little crazy, but the the world, other people, the universe will give you signs. And um, yeah, I've seen people pay attention to those signs and I've seen people ignore them. Um, mm-hmm. look for signs. I love that. That's so yeah. true, isn't it? Yeah. I would, I would say um, you need to become friends with fear. Um, entrepreneurism is a daily relationship with fear. And uh, this is why it's so important to do that inner work and get that emotional and spiritual healing so that you can approach fear from a position of strength. And the second thing I would say is ask for help. There's so many resources, so many resources. And so arrogance, arrogance and stubbornness are pretty, like they're going to they're gonna hurt you way more than they're going to help you. Mm. Those would be my two, two things I would say. And, and I guess this is a third, so forgive me, but <laughs> kind of like I said about the flame is if your heart says go, go. The head, if the heart says go, the head will never tell you to go. Wow. And you know what? I think this is even more applicable today than ever. This recording, uh, this interview was recorded before COVID-19 arrived in our lives and changed our world forever. And, you know, the fear that there is right now is palpable. And at the same time, there is so much opportunity. There are so many problems that need to be solved right now. And if anyone has an inkling of an idea, this is the opportunity to create and start our own business. Amazing. I'm working with some amazing people who are taking what they do and moving it online. People who have never used Zoom, people who have barely use technology and they're just seeing amazing results. Look, this interview with Justin and Emily is truly wonderful. There is so many examples, wisdom, suggestions and stories and they are so generous and truly the living embodiment of their business. This is a unique episode as well in that it's only the fourth interview with business partners. This extremely successful partnership is living proof that business partnerships can work. Like our previous guests, episode one with Adam Franklin, episode four with Sally and Mena, and then episode 103 recently with Manny and James, all examples of partnerships. Their business model is quite unique, but it was more unique when they very first started out. As Justin says, their original intention was to create something that didn't exist before, and it didn't then. Now their approach is becoming much more mainstream, and more so as we move into the 20s. And it's just, who knows where we're going now. I truly think you're going to love this interview conversation. As always, there's no advertising on the podcast apart from me and my book and my guests. This episode is brought to you by my book with the same name as the podcast, So You Want to Start a Business. Head over to wherever you buy your books online on Kindle um, and get your copy. Go now, get a copy. You might be thinking about starting a business while you've got the time. And as um, Emily said, having the time to listen. 
For those who like to listen, uh, there's audio version back around episode number 70. There's some um, different chapters of the book there. I just want to say a thank you for a review over on iTunes with Annie Faz writes really useful insights. Ingrid is great at guiding the conversations and asking questions that draw out her guests experience and knowledge of what it takes to launch a business. Highly recommended for anyone starting out or thinking about it. Thanks so much Annie. Reviews like that help to keep the podcast popular. I truly appreciate it. So if you're loving these conversations, please jump over to wherever you listen and leave us a five-star review if you could and make a comment. Anyway, enough from me. Let's listen to what Emily and Justin have to say about starting and running their own business and so much more. Let's go. Hello, and here we are with Emily Scorsi and Justin Foster. How are you? Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, it's lovely to be with you, Ingrid. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good. And Justin. Emily, did I get the surname right this time? It's Sikorsi. Sikorsi, Emily Sikorsi. And um, Emily and Justin are from a fabulous business called Root and River. Just before we get started, Emily, where are you right now? So I am located in the Phoenix area, Arizona, and actually in the suburb called Scottsdale. Oh, how lovely. And Justin, where are you? I'm in uh, my home office in Austin, Texas. Fantastic. So we took a little bit of time to get our our time zones right here. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, as as always, am in Sydney, Australia. So tell us, Emily and Justin, what is your business? What is this business? So we are the co-founders of Root and River, and we believe every great brand is a spiritual experience. And this is a shared belief that has really... um, fired us both up in the last five years and inspired us to work with defiant leaders who want to change the world with their business in some manner. Now that can be a nonprofit business. It can be a for-profit business. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the heart of that leader. And what we do is we help them uncover and articulate the core truths that they hold very near and dear and infuse them into the everyday language of their business. Um, And we we allow them to get to the root and then create a river that's very organic way of talking and marketing and branding themselves in the market. Oh, I just love that. When I saw your website and I read some of your material um, when we first sort of looked at at having you as a guest on the show i just love the way you talk about your customers and your clients and yeah it's just a beautiful beautiful business so when did you start this business well i think you know officially it was uh uh, five years ago this month around Mm -hmm. this time Mm -hmm. um but emily was a client of mine we met at a conference six years ago and um became friends and then she brought me into her company that she was the he- uh, head of marketing communication for. And, um, you know, it, it just, I, kn- I knew pretty quickly into the friendship and the, that I, w- I wanted to create something that was the melding of our minds. And, and as, uh, Emily was so radically opposite of me in so many ways that there was so much synchronicity and harmony in our ideas. And, and it, and it was, um, the, we did what we now call a root session, which is our first, which is our kind of flagship program. We did our first one um, in uh, about five years ago, and we and it was kind of almost on a whim, and we did it, and the owner cried, and it was, you know, it was just this, this moment, and we get out to the car, the rental car, and one of us said to the other, "What was that?" And the other one said, "I don't know, but we got to do that again." And it's like we had, it's like we found something that was like right in front of everybody, which is that it's okay, or it's not even okay. It is imperative to brand from the heart. Yeah. Emotions are good. Yeah. You want to be authentic and vulnerable and all the things that's all hot and trendy, you got to get in your heart to do that. Yeah. And Justin, today more than ever, you know, even five years ago, it was probably only just getting started with that sort of thinking. But today where there is so much competition and there is so much going on, it absolutely has to be from the heart for business, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It totally does. There's Mm -hmm. no way to stand out anymore without that genuine 
kind of emanating from that heart space. And I think, you know, you mentioned that five years ago, it was probably really, you know, we were, we were, people looked at us like we were crazy. I'll just say that. Ingrid. <laughs> we started, we started talking about soul and spirit and, and business. And like those two things can go together and those things need to go together. And those are strengths and they complement each other. And it's not religious. It's just who you are mm -hmm. as a human being. Mm -hmm. And people definitely, a lot of people looked at us with a, a turn, <laughs> um, raised eyebrows. Um, but it's been so lovely to see the world really open up to that approach. Mm -hmm. And we are so heartened to see so many big companies, small companies, nonprofits, for profits coming to us because they really resonate with that idea. They really yeah. want it. Well, and I, I think what that speaks to is that a company is lots of people. You know, it might be a company and it might be listed on Wall Street and it might be a share price in your share app on the on the phone, but it's made up of people and people have hearts and their customers have hearts. So we're dealing with a really emotional thing when people are parting with their money, when they're making decisions about who to trust. So I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell you about that. So why did you start the business? What was going on in your lives that you wanted to have this business? Um, you said you met together, you ran the first workshop, you know, the first client um, interaction, the root session. But what, what was it about having a business? Why? Well, for me, I, um, I was sure that I never wanted to own my own business. Um, <laughs> um, but this was a little bit of self-denial, which I'm really, really good at. Um, because I had actually, before I was the director of corporate communication for this human behavioral research company, where when Justin and I met, I was running a little business outside of my my house. I had been a journalist for eight and a half years, and then I was doing a little bit of marketing and a little bit of social media and ghostwriting. But it wasn't a business, you know. In my mind, I was just working and and having flexibility for for myself and my family. Um, anyway, I went in house, and then when I met Justin, it was like. I could have stayed at that company and probably, you know, soldiered on, but I, I had this moment, uh, you know, after we met and there was just this amazing meeting of the minds and a lot of really good <laughs> disagreement and friction, but admiration for the other person and the idea that what we could create together would be completely new and different. But there was this moment where I had worked in companies um, up until that point and I just thought, you know, the culture that I'm seeking as a person who wants to do good work in the world, I just feel like it might exist out there, but I don't have enough time to go and work at a variety of companies and find it. And I had this, I, I'll never forget the moment standing in my office, realizing that I just don't have the time to go find it. So I'm going to have to create it. Mm -hmm. And it was like a dawning and a realization. And I knew I could create it. Uh, with Justin. And um, so it just, even though there was a, a very a yellow brick road in front of me, I was like, nope, not going to do it. And at that moment, because of our connection and also because of that realization, that's what really spurred it for me. Yeah, that's, that's just amazing, isn't it? Yes, that, um, you know, you weren't going to find it anywhere. And it wasn't that you were particularly unhappy either in, in your corporate world and your, and what was going on in your life. It just wasn't what you really wanted. Mm. Yeah, there's a sense that also the other factor is that I want to own my own time. Like I, yeah. my kids get off of work or get off of school early. I want to be there to pick them up. And I knew I would kick ass uh, with without having a nine to five situation. And I always did enjoy a lot of flexibility in my positions, but I just needed to own my own time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and really, where did this nine to five come from? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a construct that somebody has put together and you only have to go to a train station at a busy time in the morning. And why is everyone on the train at the same time? Why is there not a different time? So it just makes, it's crazy, isn't it? So what did you want the business to be from the beginning? You know, what, 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 I mean, you've kind of talked about that, about the difference was making in businesses and about setting up brands and people understanding, you know, that it comes from the heart. But what did you want from the business from the beginning? Well, I think that the, the original intention was to create something that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. and, and it, it, and so it was, it seems kind of sparse to say that. And, but it, mm. there was a lot of like, we're going to be millionaires or we're going to go get big clients or we're going to fly around the world and do gigs. And there was none of that. I'd been self-employed 
I've been self-employed for uh, be 17 years in a couple of months. And so I, you know, it wasn't my first rodeo. I had done, I'd owned agencies. I'd done a lot of things. And I just, I, for myself, I knew I wanted to create something with Emily that was so radically different that it had never been done before. It wasn't until later, even a couple of years in, that we realized what we were doing is developing a category. And the category we developed was intrinsic branding. This radical concept that your brand is already inside of you and that your job is to show the world what's going on, show the outside world what's going on in your inside world. Mm -hmm. And those things had been unnecessarily separated during the what we call the age of management. And in this new age that we're entering into over the last five to seven years, this age of integration is you've got to show them your heart. Mm -hmm. um, intellect is a commodity. Information is a commodity. Emotion, heart, soul, spirit, those are not a commodity. Um, another driving factor for, for me, maybe more, maybe I don't want to speak for you, Em, but was I had just seen how arcane and manipulative the ad agency model was. Mm. And I wanted to, I'd been, this had been a dream of mine for years, which is I wanted to make something that was the opposite of what an ad agency is. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was another thing that was part of it. And then to Em's point earlier about freedom, it's like, it, this isn't a lifestyle business only, and it's not like we're trying to scale 10 X it's somewhere in between, which is, we want, we, want to, we want to do work that we love with people that we love and we want to get paid well doing those things. Yeah. Quite simple, actually. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, work that you love with people that you can work with and get paid well. Fabulous. You may have answered this question. When did you realise the business was real? Hmm, not a great question, Ingrid. That's one of my favourites, actually, because it, it just brings out a different answer from everybody. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's been a, in a, I guess it's a gradual dawning. So I'll cite a couple different moments. So Justin mentioned, you know, when we kind of on a whim paired up and, and did our first root session mm. and we knew there was something there. <laughs> another thing that he, another detail that was part of that story was that the gentleman um, who we were, our client, he said, I would have paid you 10 times what I paid you for this. So there was that moment where we were like, okay, this is a thing. Like that's okay. <laughs> Another voice, like, um, wow. And then, so that was a moment. And then I think there was a moment when we, we did some work for Verizon um, and we we're in New York city and we we're presenting our ideas to a group of um, pretty high, you know, high up individuals. And, you know, they just, you always, I guess you always expect if you're a little bit of a radical or you're presenting new ideas for people to sort of argue with you or jump up and run out. And they didn't, you know, they were absorbing what we were saying. Not necessarily that everyone in the room was agreeing with it, but they were, we were there, we were standing on ground and, and sharing our ideas. And it was like spurring thoughts and spurring mm -hmm. um, discussion. And so that was another moment for me. And, um, I, I, I guess I would say sometime in last year in 2019, um, we had some, some great success with, with some clients and it, uh, it just felt like the ship turned and it's more, I guess it's more of a spiritual thing for me. Like I just felt at the moment, like this is really real and it's going to go on forever and ever. Our first book was in production at that time and it's since been released. So that was kind of another piece of it too. Um, so yeah, I think getting it, you know, getting a, a very large client and having a moment in front of people who may reject you, those all really contributed to, to my realization yeah. this is a real thing. It, it's so lovely. I, I did wonder if that moment after that first session was one of those, you know, because it really did sound like, okay, this is a thing. Yeah. Tell us the name of your book. Tell everybody. Um, so if sure. the listeners want to know, um, yep. It's, a great it's, moment. Called, it's called Rooting Up. Essays on Modern Branding. I just love that. I just had to have you say it. So it's such a great, it's such a great title. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, it's it's uh, evidence of our partnership. 
It's like we, we it's, it's it every, pretty much every element of it was crafted together, which is very difficult to do. Yeah. Especially in being that we're in separate cities and we have very, my kids are grown and out of the house and I have a very different like life than M has um, from, from this standpoint. And we did this thing and it's, it's, it's quite beautifully crafted mm. and it's, um, it's a manifesto and it's what we recommend. We, we, we want to be, we want to mirror or embody everything we'd recommend to a client. And one of the things, one of our many mantras is make the world react to you. We're writing a book that tells our story that lays out our beliefs and our theories and our philosophies. It's a book that people are going to react to in the sense of, because there's a lot of heresy in there that marketing has to be about click funnels and all that BS. Um, or like you have to spend a certain amount or have a certain ad stack. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, no. there, isn't, there is an element of discipline and structure, yes, but you're just producing art that people are drawn to and they go, I want that. If, you're, if that art is podcasting or financial planning or, um, or whatever you're doing, if it's being done artfully, then that's what the world needs to see is they just need to see the art of what you're doing. Yeah. And the book is about that theory. Yeah. So everybody rooting up and it's available everywhere you get books. Is that, yeah, yeah we'll sure. put that, we'll put the connect and um, the link in the show notes. Yeah. So Justin, while you're talking there is how do you find customers? Like in those early days, how did you find customers? And I guess that, you know, it's probably similar because you've just spoken to that in terms of how, how do you draw customers to you? Well, there's kind of a, I don't know, you can break it down here, but certainly referrals from existing clients and influencers is still probably 80% of, 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 of leads or leads that turn into new client opportunities for us. Uh, podcast appearances um, yeah. has been a wonderful um, platform for us. We've met amazing people like you, but also people, your listeners then go, hey, something about what they said spoke in my heart and I want to talk to them. And then we both do a pretty extensive amount of speaking. Um, so we, sometimes we speak together or we speak together as often as we can, but um, speaking in various places around the United States has turned over some fairly massive rocks for us because, you know, it's one of those things when you're, when you're artful about what you're doing, then being live in front of people like mm. on a podcast or on a stage is a great way for them to experience you. And then that, shows immediately what makes you different and it's yeah. a, so it's the same model we would rec we recommend to our clients which is you have to be the face of your own brand mm -hmm. um so it's it's root and river but it's justin it's emily and justin and cat and jen it's humans that's what you're buying you're buying us we're the product yeah. root and river is just the publishing company for the album <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Uh, it's, it's such a great way of putting it. Um, so viability, um, you know, at some point, or you, um, Justin, had been in your own, um, you know, self-employed for 17 years. So you knew how to manage the ebb and flow of money to, um, you know, how much it actually costs to run yourself um, as a business. Um, and Emily, you were you know, you had this side hustle really um, with the journalism. But looking at this and setting this up as a business, how did you decide, um, you know, the viability of it, that it was, you know, the guy said to you, you know, I could have paid you 10 times that. That was a pretty good indication. Um, but talk to us about, you know, how did you actually think about the pricing and the funding and the, the viability of the business? Yeah, I think um, initially, you know, that as that first conversation gave us a good a good idea of where we came. <laughs> um, and I think I think we both came into it with a mindset of like let's what we have found both of us individually and together is that most people undervalue their services. So I want to say that straight out to your audience that you have a tendency to undervalue what you are doing, and we really had to look at and in early engagements we were constantly asking our clients and watching what they did after the engagements to determine more of the lifetime value of and of the engagement and then infuse more of that value up front. Um, so we quickly shifted from getting paid afterwards, we got paid up front 
um, was, was one change that we made immediately. And we, I mean, I think Justin has an extensive sales background and I'm just kind of ballsy, I'll say. Um, and I don't mind like setting value really high and having somebody tell me no, because I think we both have conviction and confidence in our approach and that it would have an impact. And then the more we worked with clients and it did have an impact and it did change the way they did business, then that allowed us to increase our rates because we were proving to ourselves our, our value and our model. Um, and, you know, obviously in, in a more practical way, we looked at other um, professional services company. We had both been charging clients, you know, on our own and individually. So we had some input and in, in, in financial understanding from those engagements. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we're, we're constantly evaluating and we're also constantly looking at how much, is, and this is really key for professional services businesses or thinking about starting a business is that you really have to dive deep into your profitability. You, it's easy to say, oh, that won't cost me. That, that's, you know, that's, I, that's just my time. And we devalue. And um, what is, you know, setting yourself, even if it's just in calculating a project rate, your hourly value, and then extrapolating that out. How many hours did you really spend on that client? And this is not necessarily to go back to the client and say, hey, I need more money, but to, to understand <laughs> your own value and to be able to set a price that it, that includes a 10% or 15% profit margin is just, we'll change your business and we'll make your business viable. So do your best at first, but then revisit it on a regular basis as you're gaining more information from your clients. Yeah, I think that last point is really vital as well is that idea of revisiting it because even um, as you as your value grows and as the value you're providing to clients grows, it, um, it really, it, it requires more more from them. Could you just wind back to what you said there about charging up front as opposed to afterwards? Could you just talk a little bit more about how that came about or why that works for people? And yeah. Mm. yeah, really important point. So at first we were like, we were doing the work because I think we were in a prove it stage in our minds and we were yes. doing the work and then we were invoicing afterwards yeah. and then we're waiting to be paid. So now we're looking at 30, 60, 90 days getting paid and we were working on smaller engagements. So it was the, the cash flow was not as, you know, readily available. And we made a change very early on where we get paid up front. Um, if you can't pay the whole thing, we paid 50, you know, 50% up front because we're holding dates, we're holding time. And then once we made that shift, that eased up everything. And um, I think in a lot of cases, we stop ourselves, we limit ourselves, like, oh, I couldn't ask for something up front. And it's simply about having the confidence to ask for what you need. It really and truly is. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was the shift that we made and that improved our cash flow, which allowed us to take on other clients and grow our business in a lot of ways uh, that we didn't, that we weren't able to do prior to that. There's something, the things, I, sorry, Justin, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, one of the things that we, I think we both learned on our own that we came together was getting outside funding as a last resort. In I don't know about in Australia, but in American culture, it's like we got to get funding. If you can self-fund, especially in professional services, you maintain that ownership, your equity and your control makes, stays in place. Um, so we've self-funded this and it's again that fine line of taking out of the business what we need in order to have the lives that we want for ourselves and our families and um that's part of it sure that's a big part of it but we've reinvested it we've we brought in someone to that does our marketing for us now um like from a from a machine standpoint we've we've got a fixed office location in scottsdale we we've we've, we've reinvested it because we're in this for the long haul. And that was the, that's the thing is like you, it's not so much the exit strategy. It's the, it, 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 some businesses are like that and that's fine, but we're in this for the long haul. I hope to know Emily when she's a little old lady and all <laughs> we're doing is just writing epic books and we're not having to do, we don't have a lot of client work anymore. Um, I also, it would be a miss. I have to just back up on something. So forgive me for editorializing here. Emily not being self-employed fully, she brought um, into this saying, oh, I don't know much about business. I don't know much about sales, but man, did she go out and learn it? And like, I look at our infrastructure, our accounting system, our 
the way we track profit, the way we run our various accounts in the business, all this maturity that we have, that's all Emily. It would have never crossed my mind to do any of that stuff. I sort of ran my businesses over the years a little bit like a hairstylist, which as long as I had money in the account, then everything was fine. And so I just wanted to say that publicly, that that business discipline did come from Emily. Uh, Justin, I love that you say that because I, I believe that a lot of um, my inherent knowledge comes from my 20 years in a corporate world as well, because that is where you get that, that um, like you said, business maturity, systems, processes, and understanding of how actually a business works. Um, and it, it's a bit like that expression, does a fish know it's in water? I think when you're working in that environment, you don't actually know that you're, you're absorbing the HR system, the, the accounting system, that it's part of the fabric of running a big business and it applies equally to a small business. I just love that you said that. Emily, you're nodding. Yes, yeah, I think I agree. You just absorb a lot. And then, um, I, I again, I said I was good at really, really good at self-denial. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I basically, I'm not going to build, like when you said side hustle, something bristled inside me. I never do anything like as a side thing. Like I do it fully. And like, when I was doing, you know, when I was kind of freelancing, I was kicking ass at it, but I don't think of it that way in the moment because I'm just, I want to focus on the work at hand. And so I think it was a shift though in starting my own business to really make space to think about the health of the business and the sustainability of the business and not just like, Oh, I'm just nose to the grindstone. I think that's something that, you know, young entrepreneurs miss is like they go in and they're ready to deliver and they're ready to, to execute or put their product together, but maybe calculate in some time for you to step back and say, okay, how is the business? Uh, you know, what, is, what processes do we need? Where do we need refinement? And, mm -hmm. and I think at first it's so easy to miss that because you're, you're trying to make ends meet and get the business off the ground, but taking time to do that and plan that in is really, really important. Yeah, it's such a great point because um, in the early stages, you can kind of wing it and you can put things together. But as you scale or as you have more clients or have, as you have more things happen in a business, those underpinning foundations are so important, aren't they? Now, Justin, you mentioned exit strategy. Do you have one? Um, like you said, you're going to be together when you have little old people there <laughs> writing your books and um, seeing very special clients. But um, talk about what is that? How do you think about the exit when you don't want to be thinking about it? I don't. You don't? I really okay. Don't. What I, what I look for, what I, what, and I think, I'm not, well, never, I won't ever speak for him, but for myself, it's iteration. It's letting the, letting, we're like a band and, you know, we're, we're, we have a sound, but that's going to evolve. You know, it's going to evolve as we, as, and, and change the soul of what we do won't, but the way it's delivered will. Um, the, I can see, um, uh, Root and River being a very stable, continuing as a very stable business. And then Emily and I doing other things that are projects that are separate from Root and River. I could totally see yeah. that happening. Yeah. Um, so I see the business evolving, but the extra strategy, and I don't mean to be dark about it, is, you know, probably a memorial, probably for me first, you know, <laughs> like, here we're done <laughs> we're done yeah, <laughs> indeed right. i love the band analogy because you know right now it's pretty there's some pretty um aging rock stars around that are still delivering amazing amazing mm -hmm. sound and all right the sound's not quite what it was but you know the crowds are still huge for them you know right yeah i think of like bruce springsteen as a model that's who i was thinking of <laughs> yeah like <laughs> His original raw sound, he wasn't a very good singer. His lyrics were awesome, but it was kind of jangly and rough. And then he just got better and better and better. And his new Western Skies album is like an opus. It's like, this is music. And he's in his mid sixties. That's the kind of thing I want from us is that we are still making epic things. We're just maturing in the process. 
Yeah, that's just beautiful. Um, we have seen Bruce Springsteen twice in the last couple of years here in Sydney and he just, I saw him in the 80s and he just is the same. He's, uh, like you said, matured and it's a music's different, but yeah, it's a beautiful analogy for it. I, th I love that. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit of reflection here. Um, going back to that five years ago, if you could take a magic wand, and I know that's unrealistic because you can't, but what might you have done differently? Because, you know, this is kind of the lessons learned. I know we can't do things differently, but what, what are some of the things along the way that um, you've learned from that you've made some changes Huh, that's a great question. Another really good question. Um, I think we did a lot of things. Like we did, <laughs> since we came at this from like just a different perspective, I think than most people, um, our focus was different. Like our focus was on each other and people and the relationships. Um, and I think that's what people tend to avoid. And that's why a lot of business partnerships kind of fail because there's not enough tending to the relationship. So we did that right. Um, I think, you know, I guess I would say that I would have, I did, we did kind of get our financial house in order pretty early, but I would even have even started that earlier mm -hmm. if I had known now, if I knew then what I know now, um, you know, just right from the get go, find a really good partner that you like. Like when we started looking for accounting and financial partners, it was like, well, this person, I heard about them. And then we just, sort of working with them. And then we're like, we don't even like this person. We don't even like being on a call with this person. And we created a standard really early on that if we don't like one of our partners, like as a person, we're not doing business with them. So we instituted that. And then that's just become a great rubric for anything that we need um, yeah. for people that we enjoy. Again, it goes back to our standard, like do work with what we love, with people we love. We use that throughout the business. So yeah. I would say get my financial order, house in order earlier and um, and implement that standard of working with people you really, really like and whether that's partners or, or what have you. Yeah. So what happens if you get a client um, that you kind of get that same feeling about as they come to you? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah. But not in, much, not in years. Yeah. Not in, not in a long time. Like, you know, my, my answer to that question earlier, Ingrid, would have been like something along the lines of saying no to a few projects that, that but you know, you got to eat. So um, yeah. I don't regret it as much as it would have been nice to not say yes to it. But then we learn from them. And one of the things, many of the thousand things that Emily and I have synchronicity around is this relationship with failure, that it's all mm. part of the artistic process. And so, um, we don't get clients. We, we don't get clients, especially since we've doubled down on our language. And I'll tell you about a specific moment in our business. It was three years ago. It was the, it was the summer, the late fall or uh, fall of 2017. And we were struggling. We were struggling and it did not necessarily look like it was going to be sustained. And we had a, we got together and we were like, what are we going to do? And we agreed we're going to double down on our language. And we, 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 we put that all great brands are spiritual experiences. We talked about the soul of the brand. We use a little profanity now and again. We just were more of ourselves. And um, so that, what that did is that set us up to um, filter out the uh, people that weren't a right fit for us. Mm. Um, and, 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 and we, we all, and we use one of our favorite words quite a bit, which is no, no, we're not going to do it for less than that because we're worth it. And we're not arrogant about it, no. but you know, it, it, it's just a sense of knowing what your boundaries are. Yeah. Lovely. Really lovely. Well, so, that good too, yes, please. Um, so we teach our clients and we use this, just it, it, this illustrates what Justin was just saying is that your job as a business is to repel the people who are not a match to you, to what you believe, to the standards that you have, to the convictions that you have. So I think in that moment, we could have said, you know what, let's just, you know, all of this spiritual stuff and it, you know, it's not very, it's really edgy and people don't like it. So let's try to do something people like. But we were both like, screw that. <laughs> 
and we're going down, we're going down. But it wasn't an automatic, like it was a consideration, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know what it feels like to be like, I want to be liked. I want this to be successful. And so I'm willing to make these compromises. But if you can look at it from the other way around of like, if I am able to speak my truth in a way that will repel the people that do not believe what I believe, it will also attract the fewer and the more suited to me people who do believe what I believe. And then from there we can build. And that was our approach. That's what we teach people to do. But you really have to let go of the idea that you're out there in business to be liked or accepted. Yeah. It's, it's a struggle and it's a switch in our minds, but you're out there to, to state who you are and what you believe and open the doors for the people that come and say no to the people who are not a match. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Um, you know, it's so very true because so often when I, I speak to people who are thinking about starting a business or who want to and, you know, who are their customers, what is their idea? And when you say, who are you appealing to? It's everyone. It's not everyone. It, you, well, one, you can't service everybody, but you don't want everybody either. That's just the wrong, it's just not part of it, is it? Well, being an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is overcoming thousands of years of biological and social programming because the biological programming is to not die. So your brain as an entrepreneur, your brain doesn't necessarily know it's not grizzly bears that are going to eat you. You know, we, we use terms like the wolves at the door and all this like dramatic terminology. It was like, you're going to be all right. You're probably going to be all right. Yeah. But you have to overcome that. You have to that, that biological response. The second part is the social conditioning, especially in entrepreneurism, which is it's got to be about scale or exit strategy or what's your funding or when's your IPO or, or it, all of that stuff. And that's fine if that's what you're into. But just like Maslow's hierarchy, the whole point here is to self-actualize. Yeah. And entrepreneurism is self-actualizing in a way that produces value in the world. You can self-actualize all day long and still not produce value in the world. But if you're producing value in the world through self-actualization, you are an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And you need good branding to go with that. And you need good branding. Absolutely. It, um, I love that description of an entrepreneur. And I, I think there's been this glamification of entrepreneurship that really isn't serving um, anybody particularly well. Um, yeah. Totally agree. Mm. So, you, Justin, you talked there about the tough time there in 2017 when you really did wonder if it was going to go ahead. Are there other reasons that it's tough in business? Like, what are some of the other tough moments? What, what, and how do you overcome that? Well, speaking for myself, um, you don't think about, and I think this is maybe something that's kind of part of the male brain, <laughs> the masculine brain which is you don't understand that your business, your wounds, your unhealed emotional wounds will show up in your business. Mm. And having a partner like Emily has been a revealer of many things about myself. And then the business was a reflection of that. And so I think it was at the beginning of each year, I, I, we've each kind of asked the question, what, can, what do you need for me to be a better partner? Well, a couple of years ago, I asked that and she goes, you could be less negative. And I was like, what? And I realized that I had this sort of negative reaction to so many things. And that was because as a survivor of childhood abuse and lots of trauma, lots of stuff that's happened, I was bringing this sort of defensive um, trapped badger <laughs> uh, mindset into business. And it's fine to stay alive, but it doesn't make you happy. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, think, I think what I would say to every entrepreneur, um, if you have unhealed emotional wounds, it's affecting your business, whether you know it or directly or not. It, I 100% guarantee it's affecting your business. At a minimum, it's affecting your relationship with the people in your business. Mm, that's, yeah. So there's a real need to heal some of that if, there's, if you're going to move forward in business. You talked there about the other people in your business and you mentioned some names earlier. Have you brought on a team? I know I interacted with one of your fabulous team to set up this appointment. Um, when did you bring people on and who did you bring on and how did you go about building that team? Yes, we do. So we have a core team of four and then we have another core team out, out around and outside of that that's uh, probably about six other people that we work with regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, we did. We did put together the team pretty early, the four of us. Um, so obviously it was Justin and I, and then 
Um, we brought in Jen and then Kat. Um, and those are both people that we um, knew and loved and had worked with before. And um, from the female perspective and maybe me as a person as well, is like, I don't do anything alone. Like if it's not a group, if it's not a collaboration, I'm probably not that interested in it. And I know um, that I'm gonna need other people to see things that I'm not seeing and pick me up when I fail and tell me that I'm off course because uh, that's just, it's just, I need it so valuable. So early days, I knew we needed that. I, I think Justin was perhaps a little less convinced, <laughs> um, but he tends to be more of the like out in front and the sort of um, more independent. I mean, I'm pretty independent too, but yeah, I'll let him talk, speak for himself as well. But um, the team was so and is so important. We have regular quarterly retreats with our team. We, we've done that from the very beginning um, because we knew how important that time together was. And being two really strong personalities, we also knew that we needed um, people as buffers, people as um, reflectors. And mm -hmm. um, I think, again, people kind of end up being the last thing that a lot of entrepreneurs look at and you, we easily fall into that, like, it's just me. I, I fall into this all the time still, like, oh, I got to do this on my own. How am I going to make this happen? And it's just, it's just a fallacy. We're doing this together. And so nurturing that team, putting them together, giving them opportunities to grow themselves. Um, those are all really important pieces of, of what we have been able to accomplish or, Vital. I don't, we wouldn't be here today without our team, without John and Kat. We would have killed each other by them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not a good option. That's not a good option, is it? No. So just to take that to the next stage as well is so feedback from team. And I totally get what you say about working collaboratively. It is one of the things I miss about the corporate world is that yes. you, know, you just, you don't have that collective brains trust, but you find it in other places, in masterminds, with coaches, in groups that you belong to. Where have you sought outside between, of the partnership? Have you sought direction from other people? Um, you don't have to name names, but what sort of outside influence as in, you know, coaching, mentoring, masterminding have you yeah, looked for? Yeah. A great question. Um, so each of us have our kind of our own circle of mentors um, and approaches that we take to this. Um, but some of the ones that are unified is we have a, a a mentor that's kind of our CFO, um, and he has been been such an instrumental, um, not around like breaking it down into the granular level, but like his wisdom of saying, as owners, there's things for you to focus on and there's things to be aware of, like that type of thinking. It's very, mm -hmm. almost like if Yoda was, or a Zen master was a CFO, that's kind of th this approach. Um, and then we have a lot of like, inf like people that don't, that we don't know them, but they do inform a lot of our, they do their source of influence on us, like Simon Sinek, Seth Godin, Brene Brown. Um, those are all, those are all part of our unofficial advisor, advisory team, because we, Emily and I are both um, voracious cons consumers of knowledge and learning and growing. Um, we're both sort of perpetual students in many ways. Um, we don't have a formal mastermind, um, really. I mean, M, you kind of do with EO, but um, but we certainly have a group of people that we turn to and say, "Hey, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, what yeah. would you do in this situation?" And it's it's been great. Yeah, I love that what you say about the people who don't know that they're your mentors because I, I I that's how I am. I mean, I'm with you. You know, there's some of the people that I read that I follow. Um, and I'm inspired by what they do and how they talk. And I take, when I'm asking questions, I'm always listening to how other people interview because um, I want to be able to ask questions in the way that helps people tell their story the best. Um, so yeah, I, I love that informal mentors and having people um, that don't know that they're helping you. So um, we're coming to the close here. Um, so three characteristics, and I don't know whether you want to give me a couple each or um, we, I always ask for three characteristics that make you successful in business um, of yourself. Um, I don't know if you want to take that question each or if um, you want to just one of you answer it, but you know, what is it about you that makes you successful? 
Um, I think we'll both just quickly answer. Yeah, I thanks. I would say number one is my tenacity. Yes. Um, I just don't. I don't stop. I may slow down. I slow. I go slow sometimes, but I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop. Um. I would say my faith or spiritual like um, yeah. awareness. Because you gotta, you got to have faith, man. There are dark days. Um, that sustains me. Um, and I, I would guess, this is probably maybe this is the obvious one, is my creativity. Um, it's just always been a part of me, and I'm always looking to add art to everything, and that makes me stand out, and that's what's helped the business the most, I would say. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Yeah, mine, I love those three. Um, but I'll, to keep it interesting, uh, I'll use different ones, um, is an insatiable curiosity, um, a, uh, a, a willingness to be a heretic. M not a willingness. I love being a heretic. <laughs> I love being the person in the room that says, I don't think that's right. Uh, that's fun for me. I love uh, that. <laughs> like, like, yeah, stiff, like, uh, what was it your mentor said, Em? Like, a, a, a good argument was a stiff, like a stiff cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, that totally resonates with me. And then the third is, um, the, third, the third trait is um, a sense of, um, what's the term? Like, almost like a, the acceptance. It's acceptance. The ability to, uh, um, to accept things as they are. And that's a fairly mm. new thing, but I realized that the things that made me resilient over the years of overcoming some of the things I overcome, they, those were still useful tools, but now it's more, rather than change the circumstances, it's be accepting of them and use what comes to us, use what comes to me. Um, and I'm a lot more, like if you would have interviewed us four or five, three, four, five years ago, I'm a hell of a lot more Zen than I used to be. A lot more grounded and calm, and um, that's reflection of a lot of Emily's influence and a lot of my own work too. To get to this place where I'm comfortable, even saying that there are strengths that I have that are contributing to the business. Yeah, so. isn't that lovely? Thank you so much, Justin, for that. Um, and that's the embodiment of your brand. Like that's who you are at Root and River. You know, that, that's what you started talking about. Is it's, you know, it's it's how you are radically different. Um, and that I love what you say about heretic. I, I often describe myself as the person who says the emperor has no clothes on. Um, it's like everyone else is, is just going along with it. And it's, can nobody see this? Am I the only person that can see that this guy has no clothes on? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and, and Emily, I just love what you said about tenacity because, um, you know, you might slow down a bit, but you just don't stop. And I think that's a beautiful way for people to think about um, because we think that tenacity has to be dogged and it has to be, uh, you know, like it's never giving up and determined. And it is. But sometimes it is about slowing down and absorbing what's going around you um, and, but keeping to that direction and the tenacity to, to really bring that outcome. I love that. Thank you. So as we finish, you've given a ton of wisdom to people who are thinking about starting a business. Just in a couple of words, what do you say to someone who is in that, oh my gosh, I've got this idea. What do I do? I'm thinking about it. I've kind of experimenting. What do you say? I would say, um, I would say foster that little flame, that little spark, leave space for it, leave time for it, put it out there a little bit, you know, mm. do what you can to foster it. And I think the other thing I would say is look for signs. Um, that sounds a little crazy, but the, the world, other people, the universe will give you signs. And um, yeah, I've seen people pay attention to those signs and I've seen people ignore them. Um, mm -hmm. look, look for signs. I love that. That's yeah. so true, isn't it? Yeah. I would, I would say um, you need to become friends with fear. Um, entrepreneurism is a daily relationship with fear. And uh, this is why it's so important to do that inner work and get that emotional and spiritual healing so that you can approach fear from a position of strength. And the second thing I would say is ask for help. There's so many resources. 
so many resources. And so arrogance, arrogance and stubbornness are pretty, like they're going to, they're going to hurt you way more than they're going to help you. Mm. Those would be my two, two things I would say. And, and I guess this is a third, so forgive me, but <laughs> kind of like I said about the flame is if your heart says, go, go. The head, if the heart says go, the head will never tell you to go. And we can sit around on our asses for years waiting for our head to go, okay, I've got, I got my business plan. I've got my funding and everything's worked out. Just listen to what your heart has to say and do it. Yeah, I love that. Oh, and that's pretty much where we could finish. But is there anything else you'd like to add before we close today? Thank you so much for everything. It's been wonderful. I, I think we just, you know, we hold space for people who want to take this deeper journey and however you're doing that we commend you and we walk with you um and if you feel like reaching out to us wherever you are in that journey for encouragement or advice we're very available um our i'm sure you'll, you'll list all no, of our but the ways. best way just verbally as people are listening what's the best way for people to contact you the best way is via social media or our website. Our website is rootandriver.com, all spelled out. And all of our socials are listed there. Um, yeah. Our handle as a company is at Root and River. And my personal handle is at Emily at large. Oh, I like that. <laughs> and we'll put all of that in the, um, we have that, that information. We'll put all of that in the show notes and on my webpage. And um, yeah, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's fun. Thanks so much for listening to another wonderful episode of So You Want to Start a Business podcast. What's your standout moments? What about that very first ever Root workshop that they ran and the client said, I would have paid you 10 times as much as I paid you for that value that you have just provided. Amazing. Who wouldn't love to have a client say something like that to them? Maybe you have had clients say that to you. I love what Justin says about intellect and intelligence are commodities today. Emotion is not a commodity. And it's emotion that can truly make your business stand out. We truly are hearing more about the soul and the emotion side of business brand versus the traditional advertising model. For many of you listening and either already in a business or thinking about creating a service-based business, the pay up front method they talked about is truly a game changer. There really is a psychological difference for clients when the payment is removed from the actual service and before and, and, and it goes before the actual service and that just makes so much sense. If you need help with how to set this up in your own business or if you're thinking about how you might do it, shoot me an email, ingrid at healthynumbers.com.au. In fact, if you need help with anything in your business progress journey, please just ask me. For everyone listening, whether this is your first episode or you've been with us for some time, I truly believe that whatever it is you are dreaming about can become real. These podcasts are designed to inspire, educate and inform about what it takes to start, create and grow a business of your own. We're here to tell terrific business stories and if you especially enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with a friend or a colleague, someone you know who might appreciate knowing more about bringing the emotional side and the spiritual side to their branding. Make it easy to have all the latest episodes by subscribing to the podcast. Anyway, as we always say right at the end of our podcast, ideas without action, well, that's what they are, aren't they? They're ideas. What actions are you inspired to take right now, today? Till the next time, thanks for listening.